Good afternoon. Cam uh, good morning, rather. Campbell McCreary here, Amvest Capital, New York City. Welcome to the Amvest Capital Inc. live webinar with Capella Minerals. Uh, Capella trades on the venture as CMIL, Charlie Mike Indigo Lima, and as NWDMF on the OTC, Nevada Whiskey Delta Mike Foxtrot. Hope you'll enjoy today's program. It will also be available in replay mode. And um, do feel free to chat in your questions in the question pane of GoToWebinar, and uh, we'll ask them in real time. Um, the replay of this event will be available about an hour after we uh, wrap up. You can get it easily at amvestcapital.com slash webinars. A um, little bit about us. Amvest is a New York-based specialist investment management and corporate finance firm focused solely on the natural resource sector and uh, all important. Uh, this call is most definitely for informational purposes only. Um, presenting today, we have Eric Roth. Is Eric making you a uh, presenter if you want to share your screen? Uh, PhD economic geologist with more than 25 years of experience in international minerals and exploration and mining project evaluations. He's been uh, significantly as associated and involved with um, quite a few successful names, including Mariana Resources, Awale Resources, Aegean Metals, Extore Gold, and Exeter Resources, Ken Ross, and a um, uh, long career at uh, Angle Gold Ashanti. Um, again, uh, following the presentation, members of Anvest will ask questions of Eric, but uh, we also really would love to have your uh, questions sent in. So, Eric, if you want to share your webcam, we'll take a dive. Hmm. There we go. Well, thanks, Andrew Campbell. Uh, thanks for the great introduction. And uh, and I guess for a lot of people in Canada who have been following the space for a while, as you mentioned, uh, they would know us from, uh, I guess, more recently, the Mariana Resources days when we had the uh, the hot martin discovery in Turkey. And, uh, and of course, the company was sold to Sandstorm back in 2017. Before then, as you mentioned, AGN, which was actually the company that acquired the hot martin project. Um, and before then, I guess, going back a decade or so, we had uh, Exeter and Extori Resources, uh, which... Uh, um, you know, which did very, very well, and uh, Extori Gold Mines in its day uh, in 2012 was sold to Yamana Gold. So, um, so, so I guess the important thing to, to sort of highlight here, at Campbell, is that we do have a track record of discovery. I, I guess really our niche in the in the business is is the discovery. Um, you know, obviously selecting the good projects and then basically taking those through to discovery and then moving them through the early stage mining studies. And so, and we've had a lot of success over the years, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners. Um, are probably familiar with some of those success stories uh, along the way. So, um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll just go through uh, the presentation here in terms of. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the presentation there, Campbell. Is it? Uh... Yeah, yeah, no, we did. Was... Now we don't. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there we go. Right. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so basically, what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll just go through the uh, the presentation as it uh, as as we have it, and um, you, you know, effectively. Um, I guess uh, I'm just trying to reduce the screen. Here we go. Um, so just uh, in terms of what we're doing, um, uh, Campbell, just, uh, just a second here. Yeah, technology is always great when it uh, <laughs> seems. So anyway, but just uh, in terms of the big picture, um, sort of where we are, the, the, the presentation just seems to be stuck. But um, uh, we, we basically, I guess, as, as a company, uh, the projects that we currently have, uh, the portfolio as it currently stands. Oh, if it's not moving, maybe I'll give it to Karen to share. Uh, okay, great idea. That's that's fantastic. Karen, we're sharing your screen. Okay. The most important asset. Okay. Yeah, that, that wasn't our field camp anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karen. All right. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, so, so, so I guess um, just to, uh, I mean, we talked a little bit about uh, our background, and I guess we've had a lot of success over the years. And uh, and with Capella, what we have now is we have this portfolio of, of five gold and copper projects. Uh, so we have uh, three high-grade gold projects, of which two are, in, uh, two are in Canada, actually in the hands of joint venture partners. We have one gold project in Sweden, and we have two high-grade copper deposits in Norway, uh, which are, one of which is called Locken, the second one is called uh, Sholey. And uh, both of those were former mining districts, which operated until uh, basically they operated until the mid 1980s. And, uh, you know, so 
you know, the portfolio as it currently stands, we have a really nice mix of brownfields exploration, so exploration around old mining districts, um, plus greenfields uh, project plays. So, um, so it's a really uh, enticing portfolio in terms of uh, what we can offer and um, you know moving things uh, forward here. So, um, so I'll just skip across to the to the global map here. So if we can just move across uh, two slides and uh, um, just to just to the just to put people into the geography where we're where we're sitting. Um, so as I mentioned, we have the two projects in Canada. So we have one which is called Domain, uh, which is the, um, it's a joint venture with Yamana Gold. Uh, so that's in Manitoba province. Uh, we have just a whisker under 30% uh, of that project. And, uh, you know, so Yamana is the project operator there. Uh, it's a project that has about 10,000 metres of drilling on it so far, but the main target for us there is, uh, is basically uh, high grade gold and iron formation deposits. And the second thing, um, and the other thing too, is that that project right now is going back through permitting and the plan is to be drilling here again in the second half of the year. Um, with the second project we have in Canada, which is uh, Savon Lake. Uh, so that's a project in Ontario. It's about 230 square kilometers of property. It's the first time that concession package was pulled together. So we acquired that 100% interest in that about uh, a year ago, uh, then come back to September. We, um, we basically did a deal with Ethos Gold, um, who many of your followers may well have heard of Ethos Gold. Um, and uh, now they are on the path to earn in here. They, they have an option to earn into 70% of that project. And uh, then obviously the plan here is that now there's people being deployed on the ground and uh, a plan here to drill again in the second half of the year. So, so the two Canadian projects, uh, there's activity on, there will be activity short, shortly on the ground and we do plan to be drilling those in the second half of, uh, of the year. Um, if I move across to, to Scandinavia, these were the most recent uh, projects that we acquired. Um, so basically what we have, um, uh, uh, Campbell, in, in terms of the project portfolio, we have a, a relatively early stage gold project, which is called uh, Southern Gold Line. Um, that's actually sitting in a belt where there's multi-million ounce deposits known. You've got uh, uh, Barcelli as one of them, which is Agnico Equal. Uh, you've got Smart Leiden, Bolli, uh, which and, and uh, Favilladen. So you've got a couple of uh, you know, there's some major discoveries already made there in that belt. It's, uh, it, we're looking for high-grade deposits with orogenic type uh, uh, systems. And uh, the plan now, right, we just announced about two weeks ago, or two months ago, I should say, uh, that we're doing an auger drill program, as, as some of your listeners would be familiar with. Uh, in that part of the world, um, basically, you are, you've got a lot of thin till cover, and essentially, a lot of that exploration is auger drilling that's, uh, that's driving that process. We do know we have gold mineralized boulders on surface, but a lot of that exploration is is, is basically happening, um, you know, just uh, with auger drilling. Uh, and, and I think the two really exciting projects, uh, Campbell, from our side, are the, are the two copper projects. So that's Lockin and, and Sholey. Um, you know, I, I mean, you know, it's a really extraordinary opportunity for a company of our size to be able to acquire projects like that, where, um, you know, these were former mining districts. They closed in the mid 1980s, high grade, massive sulfide type deposits. So these are copper rich uh, deposits. And, uh, you know, not a lot of people know much about Norway, and I'll touch a little bit on the why in Norway and some background on Norway there in a moment. But uh, I, I think the key thing is to realize that these things closed in the mid 1980s, not because there was no more potential in these districts. It's simply because copper prices got to 60 cents a pound, um, you know, in the mid 1980s. And the second thing that, of course, happened in Norway, uh, which was unique to the country, they had the oil discoveries in the North Sea. And that just, you know, after that, the mining industry just went dormant. And now we're seeing a lot of activity coming back. Um, but the lack of activity the last 40 years is not a reflection of the, the upside that we have in this uh, in this area. So I'll just jump onto the next slide, which would be the, uh, the just a, uh, just an overview of the shareholders and uh, and uh, the, the companies that you know just how the company is structured. Um, we effectively have about four major shareholders that hold about half of the company, uh, half of the shares of the company. Um, you know, and there's a mixture there. The largest shareholder right now is a, is an Austrian group who who bought in just on the strength of the Norwegian copper assets. Um, you know, we also have uh, uh, some other major shareholders in Canada. And, and, and of course, too, um, you know, we have had, had lifelong support from, from shareholders such as uh, Haywood in Vancouver, too. So, so we've had a lot of support over the years. And of course, people who followed the story, they, they know what we can do. They know our history, uh, you know, the, are people that have basically followed us through uh, as we take this uh, project forward as well too. Um, market cap at the moment, we're only trading about 15 million Canadian, so it's a very cheap entry point for what I think is a, is a fantastic portfolio, great mix of, of high-grade gold and copper. So, you know, really just an extraordinary 
um, uh, opportunity, I think, here. Um, and another thing, too, I should just mention, too, Campbell, is we do have some, uh, I guess, some of the deals we've done over the last 12 months. We've also acquired some marketable securities from um, some, uh, uh, we have some from Serato Gold. Uh, these were shares that we got from one of the Argentine divestitures. And we also got some shares from uh, Ethos Gold, um, which uh, came out of the Savon Lake uh, divestiture there. So, um, or, or, or joint venture, I should say. So, um, so you know, so we're, we're well positioned to take this forward. Um, and I'll just jump onto the uh, the next slide, which again is, uh, I guess, we sort of touched some of the, you know, our personal history. But I guess I, I just sort of highlight again that most of the company that, that you know that we see in, in Capella today is really Mariana Resources 2.0. So we have uh, myself, we have Karen Davies, uh, our VP of Investor Relations, we have Glenn Parsons. So, so most of the team, we've kept as much of the Mariana team together as possible for this. Um, and, and of course, as I mean, as you mentioned at the introduction, we've had a lot of success here, here over the years. So, um, so if we jump onto the next uh, slide here, so um, I guess, uh, you know, one of the things that I'll just talk about, uh, the, these are the projects that we acquired late last year from EMX Royalty. We, we acquired 100% interest in all of these projects. And effectively, the cost of acquisition was about, uh, was effectively 9.9% .9 of our issued shares. So, so for about a million dollars Canadian in shares, we've got 100% interest in these fantastic projects. And I'll, uh, you know, I'll step you through them uh, here in a bit more detail. Um, as I mentioned, of course, we've got one gold project in Sweden. Uh, which is a very large package. It's about 500 square kilometres in, in a belt with known mineralisation. Uh, a lot of work to be done there, and of course these two former mining districts, which are just uh, you know fantastic. And 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 one of the you know for, for people in the business, uh, I guess one of our favourite expressions is the best place to find another mine is in the shadow of a head frame, and, and that's exactly what we have here in uh, in the two Norwegian projects. So, uh, so what I'll do is I'll just give a bit of an introduction because people aren't very familiar with Norway. And in fact, uh, uh, Campbell, most of the questions we get regarding Norway have to do with, you know, how is it as a country to operate in? And, and, and of course, what kind of deposit are we looking for? Um, so if we jump to the next slide, uh, there's a little bit about the why the massive sulfides. And, 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 and just to explain what we're talking about here with these deposits. Um, so when you do the geological reconstructions, Norway, uh, that belt of copper deposits actually connects to northeastern Canada and the Appalachians of the US. So some of those um, high-grade deposits that you see in the northeastern US and Canada, that belt basically extends all the way up into Norway, and that basically is is, is why we have these copper deposits in in, in, in Norway, basically. And, and, and people, um, you know, that's always the first thing we have to explain to people. It's not just an oil-producing country. That's the North Sea. If you look at continental Norway, um, it is an extension of these known mineralized belts. Um, and, and just a comment on the why the massive sulfides. Um, so, you know, these are high dollar per ton. These are high value deposits. They're very high grade. Uh, if you look at the former Lockhart mine, that was about 24 million tons of 2.3% copper, 1.8% zinc. Um, so, you know, when you look at the dollar per ton value at today's prices, um, you know, it's over $300 a ton. And, and, and you know, if you compare that, to, for example, uh, some of the low grade porphyries, which uh, you know, these porphyry copper deposits, which people are comparing, you know, which uh, people are probably more familiar with, um, you know, these are much more valuable deposits uh, on a dollar per ton basis. Um, and a couple of other things too, these things always appear in clusters. So where you find one, you will always find others. That's just uh, the nature of the beast. Very simple metallurgy, so very straightforward to process. Um, and the other thing too, is they have very straightforward, um, because they're relatively compact projects that uh, with very small development footprints, they're re relatively easy to get permitted. So, um, so that's why we look for these massive sulfide deposits in Norway. Uh, and the next slide, we'll just talk a little bit about Norway itself, uh, because people, as I say, it's probably not the first place people think of as a mining jurisdiction, but keep in mind, it, it's been dormant for 40 years, not because of the lack of potential or the lack of support from the country. It's just simply uh, oil took over and that was it. You know, mining just went dormant for the last uh, 40 years. So. Um, so, uh, so I guess a couple of the key things here is that obviously uh, there's actually been mining here for, for since the 1600s. Lockin itself was in production for over 300 years. Obviously, fairly small scale at the beginning, but then they finally got at the end of the mine life to sort of thousand ton a day type production. Um, you know, so you've, you've got lots of good infrastructure here. There's a rich culture of mining. People understand mining, and, and even today, people understand that you need copper. Uh, for all these uh, this green energy and, and and everybody wants electric cars, phones, et cetera, et cetera. So people are very pragmatic. They do understand that we need to see these copper deposits uh, um, up and running again. Um, but just on a on a on a sort of more corporate level, there's very competitive tax rates. There's no government royalties. 
Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of the good infrastructure in place, both in terms of regular infrastructure plus mining infrastructure. So, um, you know, so I mean, that makes a big difference when you uh, are coming to build uh, mines in this country. And, and I will also mention too, that uh, we do often get asked about permitting, how the permitting works. There is actually one mine, uh, the first have off the rank, if you like, is a, is a project called Nusia, that's in Northern uh, Norway. It's now been fully permitted and construction will now begin in the second half of uh, this year. So, so it does show the permitting system is working and you are able to bring projects into production, which is obviously one of the, the, the key questions that people have for us. Um, so if we just touch on these in a little bit more detail, um, so I'll just, uh, maybe we can just move on to the next slide here. Um, but, you know, and, and what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about the projects we have and, and sort of just the context of, um, you know, sort of how we want to take these forward. Uh, so the, the, the Lockhart mine was a, was a big deposit. As I mentioned, it was about 24 million tonnes at 2.3% uh, copper, 1.8% zinc. So it was the largest massive sulphide of its class. It was a, um, the largest of these Cypress type deposits, they call them. You know, the underground mine was four kilometres long. It, it daylighted on the east and was a kilometre down at, uh, on, on the western end. It was a very big deposit. And, and I guess with this map, what we really want to show is that um, um, you know, we have the main mine in the central part of the property, but around it we have all these satellite deposits that really have had not much work done on them. And, and we've identified what we consider to be six priority targets for immediate work that, uh, you know, that we, will, we are following up now. Um, and, and there's probably another dozen or so known areas with copper occurrences that we haven't actually even done much work on. So, um, so there's a lot to be done here in terms of uh, pushing this project forward. Lots of good potential to, to, to make a near mine discovery. So that's why we call this project a mixture of brownfields and uh, greenfields uh, exploration. So, um, so, you know, and a very large land package here, we have about 200 square kilometers. So it's quite a large uh, land package that we have. Um, similar story as the Choli, which is the next slide we'll, uh, we'll look at. So now Choli is just to the east of Lochan. So this is now, uh, the Choli project is in the uh, northern part. Well, no, I guess we can just have a quick look at this slide, but uh, um, this on, on the left here is basically the, uh, this, there's actually a mine museum. I mean, this shows you, uh, you know, how, how I guess, um, you know, people are, really want to cherish, they do cherish the mining history here. There's actually a mine museum at, uh, at Lochan. Uh, you can see the model there that on the bottom left, there's a 3D model that they put into that museum. You can see the deposit, you know, it was a very, very large deposit, um, you know, and extended over four kilometers in length and, and all, all underground mining. So, so really quite a remarkable um, deposit. And, and again, just a reminder, we have a lot of the infrastructure in the, it's still in the area. You've got functioning shafts, you've got electric railways down to the port, um, you know, roads, power, everything like that. So it's a fantastic, really is a fantastic uh, place to be. So in terms of, you know, once you've got the discovery, you can move very quickly down that path to, uh, to, to, to development. Um, so on the next slide, we'll, uh, I, I think it's uh, Sholi, that'll be the next slide uh, coming up here. And, uh, and, and so basically this is now in the northern part. So we're now to the east of Lochan. This is now the northern part of, of the Rorus mining district. Now Rorus was another one of these districts. So the two main important uh, districts in, in, in Norway were uh, Rorus and Lochan. Um, now, basically what we've been looking for here is we, here we have a similar situation. There were mines that were in production here but there's lots of potential you can see you know there's a, an awful lot of potential along strike along these prospective horizons to bring new deposits into um, into production here and uh, in, you know get them through the discovery and then bring them into resource status and move them forward um, in that map on the left um, you know, just over the winter what we did do is we did uh, a data mining uh, uh, process i guess with uh, with windfall geotech and uh, and essentially what we did with that process was there's, there's an awful lot of data um, available for these projects and a lot of it has been collected by the government so so what we did is we took all the data we took calibration points of known deposits and then just applied that literally pixel by pixel to the entire project area and, and what came out of that was essentially uh, 26 targets came up with high grade copper potential um, and some of them are very very large you know you've got so there's at least half a dozen that are over two kilometers in length um, and you know we see great potential now to, to move those projects forward uh, into drilling and, and get, getting them on to the next stage of which after drilling is of course uh, the resource definition so um, so lots of upside uh, the two mines on that map uh, uh, basically Sholey and uh, Schillingdahl they were the two mines that were in production they were both smaller than uh, Lochan they were probably about five million tons apiece 
but they were still very, very high grade, both in terms of copper and uh, zinc. So, um, so again, we see fantastic potential here. Um, there's a photo on the bottom bottom right there where you can basically see the, uh, uh, we're, we're sort of, this is uh, above the tree line here. It's just flat grassy plains in this area that we're operating. So very simple to get around. And of course, uh, again, great infrastructure. It's right by the major highway, the railway that goes to uh, from uh, uh, Trondheim to uh, the city of Aurorus. So, um, so basically the plan is to move these forward into drilling as quickly as we can as this uh, season progresses. Um, uh, Campbell, so one of the extraordinary things too, if we just on the next slide, you'll see, um, and this just really gives you a great idea of the potential on these uh, these deposits, is that you can actually still walk, you know, along the strike. I mean, these are, these are outcrops that are kilometres away from the old mines, uh, where you can actually stand on massive copper, uh, I mean, massive sulphide type mineralisation on the surface. Um, the photograph on the left. Um, is it, actually sort of just a weathered massive sulfide, but um, you know it's running 2.2% copper on surface and has never been drilled. And, it, and, and you just look at something like that and you think, well, I mean, you know, where does that happen in the world that you have that opportunity? You've got very high grade copper on surface, and, and nobody's ever drilled it. I mean, it's just, just, I mean, it's, it's mind blowing. So, um, you know, and then as I mentioned, we've got, we've got 15 kilometres of this perspective stratigraphy to test here. So there's a lot to be done. Um, now, of course, some of these. A target like that is kind of a no-brainer. You just get in there and drill it, and see which uh, you know, see what you've got underneath. But of course, we do need to fine-tune some of the other targets and then bring those into drill status as uh, as quickly as possible. So, um, so but you know, so that just gives you an idea of the upside. But you know, we, we feel very strongly there's very good potential here. Um, the other thing too, just to keep in mind, is that um, you know, at these kind of grades, you only need 10 plus million tons in a deposit to become a mine. So. Um, you know, so we feel that's a very simple objective in both of these uh, these projects here. It's something that's achievable. You know, it's you don't need a big volume of a deposit. Uh, you know, at these kind of grades to to basically get an operation up and running again. So uh, so we feel very strongly there's great potential here on these copper projects. So. Uh, now we move on to uh, Sweden. So this is that was the Norwegian side of things, and 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 as you probably gathered, I, I really do like these high grade copper deposits. I think they're just a, a fantastic addition to our portfolio. Um, you know, the gold project we acquired from EMX also, that's the Southern Gold Line in Sweden. So that's a fantastic deposit as well. Um, yeah, I mean, a, a project, very large project area. As I mentioned, there's three known deposits in this belt. Um, you know, we're looking for repetitions of those high grade gold deposits. And, uh, you know, so, so, but this year will probably be more of a, let's sweep through the project systematically and uh, really just, you know, zoom in on the targets for drilling uh, perhaps in the next winter or uh, next summer. Um, and as I did mention, we do have these, one of the characteristics of this area is you do have this thin till cover. The photograph on the right shows that we do have mineralized gold boulders on surface. And uh, basically the exploration is now looking uphill, if you like, it's looking upstream for the source of those, those mineralized boulders. So, so that's an exciting project too in its own right, but discovery drilling will probably be happening either this winter, I mean, the Northern winter or, uh, or next year. So. Uh, so then that brings us, that sort of rounds out, I guess, the Scandinavian part of the portfolio at the moment. So I guess we'll just uh, chat, uh, we'll just move on to the next slide and we'll just chat about the, uh, uh, the Canadian projects again, just to, just to remind people what we do have in Canada. Um, so uh, we do have the, uh, the domain joint venture in, in Manitoba, which as I mentioned is with Yamana Gold. That, that is a contributing joint venture, so we do contribute on a pro rata basis. Um, as I mentioned, it is going through the permitting process and we are hoping to be drilling here again in the second half of the year. Interesting thing about domain is that you have, uh, you know, we have, we've only tested probably about 800 metres of what is about five kilometres of perspective uh, uh, stratigraphy to test. And uh, so there's a lot more to be done there. And, I, and I'm, I'm very confident that this is a project that can be brought into to resource status in the short term as well too. Uh, and of course, the second project there was, uh, was Savant Lake. So basically at Savant, uh, the, the key thing there is we now have Ethos Gold as the joint venture partner. Uh, for those who do know Ethos, you, you'll be aware that Ethos is a very, um, you know, they're very technically strong. They're a very strong company um, and also obviously well known in Canadian markets. So, uh, so we're, we're very happy to have uh, uh, Ethos on board as a JV partner. And uh, again, as I mentioned, we also plan on, on drilling this here in the second half of the year. So. Um, and then we just have a couple of summary slides just in terms of uh, what uh, the, you know, the, a little bit more detail. These, these corporate presentations are actually on the, the, uh, the website, so I won't go through to this in too much detail. Um, but this is just a, a, a section, just a map and a section from, uh, from Domain, same with uh, Savant. Um, but again, the key thing is uh, these, are, these are managed on a day-to-day -day basis by our joint venture partners. 
the, the things that we manage on a day-to-day -day basis are our Scandinavian projects. So, uh, so, but it is an exciting portfolio, and uh, we are looking forward to pushing this forward. So, and then, then we just come to sort of the, I guess, the movers. What's what are the value drivers for the company for this year? You know, I mean. As I mentioned at the beginning, the big picture story is we have five active projects at the moment. The company's never actually had that many projects active at, that, at any one time, so it's a great opportunity. We have three gold projects, of which two are in Canada, uh, one in Sweden, and the two uh, copper projects, of course. Um, as I've mentioned, I do believe uh, very strongly in these these copper rich, these high grade massive sulfides in Norway. Um, you know, so so I think there's really great potential for for discovery there in the short term. Um, and the big picture, we do expect to be drilling four of those five projects before the end of the year. So, um, so as I mentioned, the two Canadian joint ventures, are, are basically, we do expect to be drilling those second half. And then our two copper projects, we are looking to, to get to um, finish up the drill target generation and get into drilling as soon as we, we possibly can. Uh, and then the fifth project, of course, which is Southern Gold Line in Sweden, uh, that will be a program for next year, probably so. Uh, but we do expect four of the five projects um, to be drilled. And of course, in our back pocket, we do have these shareholdings and other uh, corporate entities too, which is extra upside for, for Capella shareholders as well too. So, so, so that's kind of the synthesis of uh, of what we have and, and where we're going. And I guess um, uh, you know, I guess I can leave it uh, with you, Campbell. I guess in terms of if you have questions or or how you would like to take this forward from here. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you. Um, just circling back to Norway for a moment. Um, uh, what can you add, I guess, in this, the sort of regulatory regime regarding surface rights, underground rights, royalties, mm -hmm. government um, uh, involvement, and I mean, do they have a equivalent of crown land, that sort of thing? And then just um, uh, would you say you get much support from the, the their geological survey uh, groups? And, mm -hmm. and then finally, um, just tie into that, uh, history of permitting it's all mining's really the, the permitting business actually when you <laughs> yeah so. of course yeah. absolutely Campbell and, um, and just as a um, you've had you, I guess you've asked a couple of questions there so I'll just uh, yeah. go through sort of, uh, one by one and in terms of the permitting and the local uh, relationships um, so I guess where we are it's a mixture of state land and also private land holdings um, now, under Norwegian law for, for general exploration work, for example, there is a thing called all man's right that anybody can walk anywhere, basically, as long as you're not doing damage to a property. So there's no, you know, of course, out of courtesy, we'll go talk to people, we'll let them know what we're doing, we, we you know, show them the work plans. Um, and then, of course, as you get further down the, 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 I guess, down the pipeline to drilling and then to, to you know, to, to building mines again, then I guess, um, you know, that's just a longer process where you're obviously talking to the locals um, and, uh, you know, just push these things through. As, as I mentioned, uh, there is one project that has now got its permits in northern uh, um, Norway. Um, so the permitting system is working. Uh, generally, in all these things, the, the key thing is communication. There's a lot of support from the state. Um, and as I mentioned, one thing that works very, very strongly in our favor here is that these are old mining districts. So, so we're not talking about, uh, you know, the, the, I mean, they're not, I mean, you know, they're basically old mining districts with all, all a lot of the old mining infrastructure is, uh, is still there. So, uh, so, and, and, and the other thing too, I, as a, just as a comment, uh, again, you know, these are very compact deposits, so I don't see any issues on the, on the permitting side. So, um, so, you know, but uh, a lot of people there, as I mentioned, they do have a family that worked in the mines. So people do remember what mines are and, and uh, you know what they can bring to the to the table. Uh, you asked about the geological survey. Now the geological survey has been fantastic. They've been very very uh, supportive. Um, now they basically, um, you know, they've flown. For example, in Sholey, that's a great example where they flew an airborne geophysical survey precisely for the the, the one reason was just to entice exploration companies there, right? So um, so so they're very very supportive in terms of. Uh, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, we can do what we need to do. Uh, there's a, a lot of data available for, for some of these areas. And it was actually quite incredible to think that we could actually, or EMX a year ago, could actually just stake this ground. It was open. I mean, I mean, it's not like we they were required from anybody. It was just open. I mean, so, um, you know, so, so it is quite an extraordinary uh, situation there. Um, you did also mention royalties too. Uh, there was a question on royalties. So the, there are no government royalties in uh, in uh, in Norway. So, but what you do have to pay is a 0.5% royalty to the landowner. So, so that you know, in an indirect way, is compensation for you know the work that gets done on his uh, or her property. So, thank you, um, Stu. I want to give a crack. Yeah, thanks for uh, the presentation, Eric. Um, 
if you could just touch on, I guess, the transition from you know New Dimension and Argentina to Capella today. Sure. Yeah, uh, sure, Stuart. And uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, for, for people, we, uh, I guess, um, until 2020, the, the portfolio consisted of the two projects in Canada, which we just talked about. That was Domain and uh, and Savant Lake. We also had a, a portfolio of projects in Santa Cruz province in, in southern Argentina. So um, now uh, what happened during 2020 was effectively uh, two things. I mean, basically, first of all, um, you know, we took the decision to basically divest all of our Argentine portfolio simply because uh, not that there's anything wrong with Santa Cruz as a jurisdiction or the projects, but um, there's obviously, you know, Argentina as a, as a national, uh, as a destination has its ups and downs and, and, and it's not everybody's cup of tea, I guess, as, as an investment destination. So we, we just took the corporate decision to, to divest our Argentine assets uh, and then focus on effectively Northern Hemisphere projects, which is, which is what we have now. Um, and then in November last year, we did that name change. First of all, to be honest, New Dimension wasn't a name that, uh, um, you know, I, I guess Capella is a much more appropriate name for the company, given that uh, we are now focused on the Northern Hemisphere. And, uh, and Capella, as you probably know, is one of the, the, the nights, the stars in the Northern night sky. So, so that's sort of where the naming came from and just sort of the, the rebranding, if you like, just to reflect the, the, the change in, in strategy going forward. Yeah. And, and you have a large land package, both in Norway and Sweden. Uh, so what, how do the holding costs work um, you know, on the concessions for you? Yeah, so the holding costs aren't, aren't uh, all that extra exceptional. I mean, uh, you know, in Norway, uh, so we have basically between the two projects, we now would have close to 500 square kilometers. Um, so, uh, but you know, the, the, the annual, uh, I guess the, uh, the holding costs are just paid on an annual basis and they do increase with time. But uh, for the moment, it's not a big part of our budget. You know, it's not an important to uh, consider. I mean, it's not a, a big cost for us. Um, in the case of Sweden's a lot more, a bit more expensive to hold the ground. Uh, and the other thing in Sweden is too, you do need to pay the, the licenses three years in advance. So, um, so, you know, one difference in Sweden is that you do need to pay um, you know, I mean, when you when you take the ground, you need to pay, for example, the first three years. So so and and, and the costs also go up with time. So obviously, there's you know the idea is that you need to as you go forward to reduce those property areas to to bring yep. them down to more manageable uh, costs. So yeah, and then um, is there like a permitting process for drilling and drill locations? Yeah. So, so everything. So, so the early stage uh, projects, uh, Stuart. I mean, so early stage stuff basically is just uh, really advising the landowners, and, and if there's, you know, if anybody has any objections, uh, then once you get into drilling, then of course it's the same thing. You're advising landowners, and then just going through a, a, a more formal uh, permitting process with the mines department as well too. But of course, at, at the end of the day, you know, the key thing is always that communication with with any potential landowners in the area too. So. Um, one of the things that's actually uh, changing on the on the scene too, Stuart, is that um, uh, you know there are other ways to drill at the moment. So they are also looking at bringing in, for example, man portable diamond rigs, which do less damage uh, in terms of you don't need to drive across people's uh, you know fields to get to the, the drill sites. Um, so there's all sorts of things that we can look at here just to minimize our impact. But uh, um, you know, I, I th at the end of the day, it's mostly communication, and then as the project yeah. gets more advanced, then of course the mines department becomes involved as well. Yep. Fair enough. Yeah, I've seen some of those, um, you know, track mountain rigs work well, and you know, Mexico and other hard, hard to get places. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And the other thing too is obviously people like doing drilling in the winter when the ground's nice and hard. So, so yeah. that's the you'll tend to find most people do the drilling in the winter rather than the summer. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed in the presentation you have some nice, you know, gold bearing rocks at the surface or boulders, um, some old adits you can target. You know, what other exploration techniques? Are you finding what best for you to define your drill targets? Yeah, so so in the case of the Swedish project specifically, um, so I, I'm not sure if you we, we, either side, but if we start with the Swedish projects, because you are under that till cover, you've you've really only got the two options. One is that uh, um, airborne geophysics works really well, and, and in the Swedish project, uh, we will do a drone magnetic survey over the, the the key bits of the property to make sure we understand the underlying architecture, the underlying underlying geology of this uh, of the of the project area. Um, and then really this um, this uh, auger drilling is effectively systematically going through the area, through the projects and just looking for these geochemical anomalies and effectively getting to where you need to in terms of, um, you know, just homing in on, on the source of these gold bearing boulders that we see on surface, but we just don't know where they came from because they're not yep. exposed, the source isn't exposed on surface. Got it. Thanks for that. I'll pass it on to Adam. There we go. Thank you.
Great to see you, Eric. Can you hear me all right? I guess it's been a few years since the Xtory days. So uh, I guess uh, right. you know, we've been in New York quite a few times in the Xtory days. So uh, it's a small world at the end of the day mining. So Exactly, exactly. I, I'm interested in in, uh, in these high grade uh, copper VMSs, uh, you know, that you guys have. So that was open. That was open ground, even though these are historic mines. Yeah, it's it's, it's open ground. And, and one thing I will add too is that uh, so we were able to stake basically the properties. Um, and the other thing too, which I, I probably it also ties into an earlier question on the permitting too, is that the uh, the, the state actually assumes responsibility for any environmental rehabilitation work the you know, I mean, we are only responsible for what we inherit today. Um, the government's actually spent a lot of money over the years, you know, rehabilitating the sites. So the sites overall are really, really clean, as you as you would expect in in in, in a place like Norway. Um, but um, you know, we effectively we are only responsible uh, for the work that you know, I mean, what we do going forward effectively. But um, between either the government or the previous landowners is where most of the responsibility falls in terms of any potential rehabilitation work. But as I mentioned, a lot of that's already been done and, and, and the properties are actually in great shape. They're in very, very clean state, you know, considering they're old mining districts. And... It looked like that the, um, the historic buildings and mills and, and whatnot were all still there. What's the What's the situation there? Is that are they left those up on purpose? Are they are they uh, beyond um, uh, beyond refurbishment? Um, what's the what's sort of the status there? Yeah, so a lot of that atom could be brought into uh, it, it could be cleaned up and brought into uh, active service very very quickly. Uh, so in in the case of there was a uh, there was one picture there of, the, of where the old concentrators were, and uh, effectively, obviously, you know, it's been dormant for 40 years. So, I mean, obviously, that you know, you need to replace the concentrators, but the basic uh, structure, you know, infrastructure is there. Uh, you've got an, an old, you've got an operating shaft still there. So one of the shafts, uh, uh, Astrup, is still operating. I mean, it's still fun not mining, but it's still functioning. Um, you've got electric railways from from the Lochan area to to the deepwater port. So you've got a lot of this infrastructure, and in fact, today they've got tourist trains on it, right? So. Um, so you know a lot of this stuff is it would take actually very little to to, to bring back into to what we would call active service. So you know that's one of the huge advantages here, I think. And, and the same similar thing in Sholey as well too, um, because you are right next to major highways and railway lines as well too. So you've got a lot of good infrastructure around to tap into. Eric, what's your thinking in regards to defining uh, or in the uh, from the mines that you know recently, I mean, that shut down in the 80s, defining more ore that could be accessed mm -hmm. via that existing infrastructure, via these uh, versus the the satellite uh, VMS ore bodies that you know targets that you guys have identified. Yeah, look, it's a good question, Adam, and uh, and I guess uh, so. In the case of Lockham, um, I guess uh, you know, as I sort of mentioned, the the, the bottom of the, the the old mine is a kilometre down, so it's a fair way down. So so I, I guess as a first pass, we're not going to be looking for extensions to the to the deposits that are kilometre down when we have all of these satellite deposits on surface that are basically at surface or very near to surface. So. So the immediate priority for us will be to look at the near surface things, um, just because obviously at the beginning uh, it's quite risky to, I mean, the mine is flooded, so there's no way to get underground, I guess, uh, So uh, at the moment. So so the priority for us in the short term will be looking at all of these satellite deposits, these near surface deposits, um, and then down the track we'll look at some of these deeper extensions. But obviously the focus right now is to look more at the near surface stuff. Eric, has, have these VMSs been turned 90 degrees and that's why, you know, they were running down a kilometer deep? Is that what we're looking at? Uh, so in the case of, um, uh, so in, in the case of, I mean, not, without getting too technical, in the case of Lochin itself, it's actually just a, a tabular body. It's in an ophiolite sequence. So it's actually just ocean crust that was pushed up to the surface. Um, so it's just a large tabular body that just uh, has been folded and, and, and is now inclined in this sort of orientation. Um, you know, similar thing happened at uh, Sholey as well, although it's different host rocks there. But but Sholey, um, or the Shillingdale mine at uh, Sholey, also went to about 1.4 kilometres deep. So th these were quite extensive bodies. I mean, they're not, uh, you know, I mean, they, they were really quite extensive deposits. So um, so, but but there there is a combination of folding, and, and there's been some obviously some I guess post uh, uh, depositional uh, changes to the bodies. But but for all intents and purposes, they're they're, they're still intact and they're very large. Uh, you know, and, and Lockin was a great example of just this big tabular mass of massive sulfides. Why were they driving down so deep when and uh, and leaving that uh, those, those showings at the surface without even really testing them? That's uh, it, it seems yeah, strange. 
Yeah, I, I guess they. I mean, it was such a it was such a rich deposit locking that uh, I guess they just didn't want to stop. I mean, it was quite a quite a thick uh, body of massive sulfides too, and, and and a really rich ore body. So, um, so so I guess if you're already in the underground mode, they just uh, for some reason that was the focus. I mean, it's actually a very good question. I I actually don't know. I mean, there's actually if you look at some of those satellite deposits, I mean, half, most of them don't even have drill holes. There's very very few drill holes on these things. Um, so they you know they made. You know, not not zero effort, but pretty close to zero effort to really look at the potential on those satellite deposits. Um, I think they were just inside Lockin, and they just kept following the seam, if you like. You know, they just kept following the massive sulfides. So, but it is a it is a very good question, and, and it is quite extraordinary. So, and, and I don't see uh, uh, from, from you know from what you, what you've presented, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, a lot of stacking uh, of of these VMSs. Is that does does that um, strike you as funny um so when you look at the typical sections um so i mean the, the, if you look at Lockin itself i think some of these are stacked i mean there are there's also some post mineral faulting if you look uh, you know when we zoom in into the Lockin map in more detail you'll actually see there's some post mineral faulting so some of these things have been displaced as well um but there is quite a complex uh, history here in terms of folding and faulting so um so one is that you know the the stacking that happened when it formed i mean different horizons that have been realized but then you have had different you know a lot of folding and, and, and sort of late stage folding as well to, to chop this thing up so um so you know we still need to do a bit of work on that but uh, you know there's there's very good potential and, and some of these uh, um you know these surface expressions have some pretty good to, i mean they just look at surface like pretty good to, uh, you know things to look for um, one thing I will also add to Adam is that we do have um, again a similar situation where there's a lot of existing data like uh, electromagnetic data which is uh, uh, one of the geophysical surveys that they flew and that's of course one of the favored tools for looking for massive sulfides so you, you do see anomalies of depth in these things as well too and that's the you know I, I guess for us it'll be a combination of the geology and geophysics that'll be driving us uh, as we as we push these forward. And, and I, I presume that uh, historically they got good separation, uh, you know, between uh, the copper and the zinc. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't have, you know, kept pursuing this stuff. So it must have been. I'm assuming Eric, everything has been recrystallized, so you get nice, you get nice separate mineral separation. Yeah, that's correct. And and, and in the case of uh, Sholey, it is it is basically a, a, a low sort of you know green schist or even higher sort of metamorphic. So these things have been recrystallized for sure too. So. Um, and, uh, and and interestingly, I guess throughout the history of, of Lockin, for example, in the early days, they just threw the zinc out. They didn't even collect the zinc. So they just, you know, so the mine started with just copper. Uh, then eventually, I think, you know, sort of the last 30, 40 years of the mine, they started recovering the zinc. Um, and, and there's no data at all on the gold and silver in this thing as well, too. So they never, you know, I mean, uh, there's actually still a lot of potential they could have extracted from those old mines. Yeah, I, with the surface showings, it seems like a little bit, you know, shooting fish in a barrel. So I, you know, I presume, you know, you're just going to start going after these things. And if you can find something that's continuous enough and thick enough, you just focus on that. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess uh, one of the targets in the West was called drag set. And, and that's probably the most advanced in the sense of, you know, the most extensive surface workings. And, and that will be one of the places that we start just, be, just because, you know, just on the back of what they've done at surface. Uh, but, uh, um, but again, as I mentioned, it'll be a combination of the geology and the geophysics, which really drives us on this uh, because, um, you know, obviously the geophysics will help at depth, particularly for, um, you know, basically for looking for extensions to these things at surface. Excellent, excellent. Well, with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to Erdi. Thank you. When we look at your Scandinavian uh, projects and the recent explorers, uh, mm -hmm. is, are your thesis uh, mostly same with theirs, or do you think you guys are adding different technical perspectives to these projects? Uh, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, I think um, I, I'd say we probably are adding a different uh, perspective. Uh, uh, you know, I particularly like massive soil clients just because, um, I mean, in the 1990s, I worked for a company called Ore Resources, AUR, which uh, was a Toronto-based company, um, you know, and, and Ore had the, the Lubicore discovery in, in, in Quebec and uh, near Val d'Or. Um, you know, and these massive sulfide deposits are just fantastic things to have. They just, it, it, I mean, Ore went from a, um, you know, from an explorer basically then to a miner, it, it had, you know, a nice discovery there at Luvigor and then just grew and grew and grew from there. So, so you know, I, I think what we can add is, you know, we have had a lot of exposure to massive sulfides. And, and in fact, if you look at uh, Norway today, there's actually very few people left in the metals business, right? So, I mean, everybody, 
you know, to just jump into the oil space. And it's actually very difficult to even find, um, you know, people in, in Norway that still work in mining. Right? So, so I think what we can bring is, you know, we can bring that in, um, you know, of course, in our hot Martin project in Turkey too, we were at the, the uh, I guess, the eastern end of, of one of the major massive sulfide belts in, in Turkey as well too. So, um, you know, so, so we've had a lot of exposure to massive sulfide. So I think we can add a lot to the equation there. And in terms of the gold project in Sweden, um, you know, I guess all of us have different experiences in gold as well. Um, you know, I guess my career started in the in the RP in the Western Australia. So, I mean, you know, we've all had varied experience over the years. And, and I think we can look at this. Um, another interesting thing that I will add uh, with the Swedish project is geologically, it's actually very similar to, we have a sister company called the Raleigh Resources, which is working in, in uh, Ivory Coast and uh, geology is actually very, very similar. So, you know, so we get a lot of cross pollination there too, in terms of um, ideas. So, so I do think we can bring new ideas to the table, new concepts as well, for sure. Thank you. And can you give us some more clue? Uh, this type of deposits, when it comes to the real mining scenario, uh, what mm -hmm. kind of environmental uh, footprints these deposits can leave? Yeah, so, so if I look specifically at the massive sulfide type deposits, um, really what we're looking for is, is, is basically um, the first preference is, is something that's underground. I mean, something that can be mined. Maybe there's a starter pit, but it would be mostly underground. So, so you know, that of course makes a big difference because you don't have a big surface uh, expression. Um, the other thing too, the massive sulfides, because they are just the, the end product is a concentrate. So, so basically, you know, that's sort of standard off-the-shelf technology. It's nothing from you know nothing complicated in the sense of from a permitting perspective so um, and also a compact and, and the other thing too these these mines are, aren't huge throughput in terms of a daily throughput you know maybe it's a thousand or a couple of thousand tons a day so we're not talking about you know huge volumes of material going through a mill so um, so you know so those are the advantages I see with with deposits like this and I think that the footprint is small just because of the nature of the beast they're very high grade very simple metallurgy the end product is a concentrate and the concentrate gets uh, gets shipped out so um so you know that's the huge advantage i see of of, of copper deposits these these kind of copper deposits in norway so uh, thank you and my last question is uh, for the local projects you mm -hmm. you mentioned six targets uh, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, anomalies you are gonna follow up there and what is the budget uh, to test those six targets yeah, so uh, so that's a good question, and uh, so we, I guess the, the the targets have been selected just on the basis of uh, initially where we feel uh, you know just in, in the geology we see on surface and and the existing geophysical data where there looks like there's good potential. Keeping in mind there's not a lot of drilling on. I, I mean, drag set is the project the, the the area that has the most drilling, and it's like you know half a dozen holes. It's nothing, right? So. Um, you know, so so basically, what we're looking at is we're looking at the combination of geology, the geophysics, and really just looking where do we see, keeping in mind that we're looking for 10 plus million tons here of these uh, in these massive sulfide deposits. So um, so anything that's sort of 10 plus million tons potential, and keeping in mind it might not be in one, it could be in a couple of bodies. Um, but you know, we're, we're always sort of focused on that. We're looking for that sort of our goal is 10 plus million tons at those kind of grades in these deposits. So we'll, we'll just roll everything together. Now the budget basically is, uh, so initially now for the next few months, we have more uh, drill target generation work to do. So we just need to tighten up some of the things that we want to drill. And then of course, when we get ready to drill, we'll then just, uh, decide how many uh, drill holes we need to, to do to test the targets. So, um, but for the next couple of months in Lochen, we still have more of this uh, drill target to the generation work to, to be doing, so. Thank you, Eric. Uh, that's it from me. Thanks, I just asked one quick question. So if, if you just summarize kind of uh, you know, the timing for drilling and you know in an ideal world, you know, yep. um, mm -hmm. and how you split it up across the projects. Yeah, so, so so if I look at the four projects we want to drill Stuart before the end of the year, so so keep in mind the Ethos Gold uh, JV in, in Savon Lake uh, in Canada, That's we, we are free carried on that, so we don't need to contribute to that because they are earning into the project. Um, the second project in Canada is is a, a domain, that's the Yamana Gold Joint Venture, so we only contribute 30% of the costs. Um, so the two projects in Canada are fairly low, um, you know, there's no not much in the way of spent commitments on those, and then of course 
what we do manage 100% and pay for 100% are the three Scandinavian projects. So, um, so with the two copper projects, I would like to get drilling as quickly as we can. Uh, you know, we've got a few more months of, of, of the target generation work. Let's refine these, get out there and drill. Um, and then, you know, it, after that, it's just going to be a question of let's prove the concept, let's get some good hits, some good, you know, some show the concept, I guess, and then move forward towards uh, bringing these things into resources. All right, thanks for that. Campbell? Go um, mute. Um, someone wrote in, um, he got the impression that a lot of, in the 43 one on one, approximately 25 plus percent of the ground is covered by natural a natural reserve status uh, property. Is that is that uh, true? And uh, there was an ammo storage dump nearby. And um, in general, how do you see permitting uh, with with going forward with some of that? Yeah, so, so it's on the nature reserves. So so just keep in mind they're not national parks. They're nature reserves where. Um, you know, you're sort of basically above a landowner, but you're not in a national park, which is obviously a different level again of, of, of protection. And, uh, you know, keeping in mind that around Lochan, um, there's really nothing that you could even call virgin forests anyway, because a lot of it was already taken down, uh, you know, over the last few hundred years. So, yes, uh, particularly in the eastern part of the, the, the area. Um, so places like Dragset, which is our number one sort of target, we don't have any issues with, with you know, potential nature reserves. Out to the east, there's a couple of these nature reserves. It, it doesn't mean you can't work in them. It just means you need to take extra care. So, so they're not national parks. That's a, that's another level up the chain of, uh, of sort of uh, you know national park status, if you like. So, um, so of course, you know any of those targets in those areas, we need to manage those much, much, much more carefully uh, for anything we do in those areas. Um, yes, in, in the old, uh, so they did have some ammunition disposal in the old uh, Astrup shaft, and that was the deepest of the shaft. So that went to, that shaft was over a kilometre in depth, and the government used it for a while as just a place to, to get rid of old, I mean, just to blow up old explosives. Um, we have been talking to the government about that, and basically the, um, you know, they're happy to, to stop that if it means that uh, the mine can go on. It's not like they store explosives down there, they just actually detonate the old explosives just because it's a long way down. Um, so, but the government has basically said to us, they're very, very happy to, to forget all of that and let's focus on mining if, uh, you know, if that's uh, uh, what makes sense here in this area. So, um, so yes, there was some ammunition disposal, but it's not storage, it's, it's just ammunition disposal. Um, so, uh, and the third question I uh, was just, I can't remember the third question now, I guess. Uh, um, A permitting. Oh, permitting, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so with the permitting again, similar thing. Um, so, for early stage exploration, so so for the for the early for the drill target generation, it's really just advising the landowners. There's no, um, as I mentioned, there is this all man's right that allows you to to literally walk anywhere. I mean, obviously, letting the landowners know what you're doing. Um, but uh, for the early stage work, not much is required. For the drilling, once you get into drilling, then of course it needs uh, you know proper consultation with the community, let people know what you're doing, and then the mining uh, bureau becomes involved as well too in that. So, but obviously it's making sure that everybody's comfortable with with what's going on in the area here. So, um, as I did mention, you know because these are old mining districts, it obviously is uh, uh, you know it's it's a lot easier um, because people aren't familiar with mining in this area. So you know it's it's not something that they haven't seen before. So. Mm -hmm. um... COVID in Norway, what's uh, the on the ground reality? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Campbell. It's actually tough at the moment. Uh, I mean, the, the, the borders, in that, that's probably our biggest challenge right now is that uh, the international, the borders are closed to foreign nationals. So, um, so anybody who's not a Norwegian national, you have a very, very, very hard time getting into the country. So, um, so you know, as a consequence of that, we're sort of using as many local people as we can. But I, for example, can't get in at the moment. But having said that, we are hoping that things will get relaxed over the next uh, short while. So, um, but for the moment, it's actually very, very difficult just with the restrictions that have in place. More in terms of, you know, not not that there's a COVID problem in the area uh, where we're working, but it's just actually physically getting into the country. And also bringing in other contractors if, you know, if there's particularly contractor skills that aren't available in Norway, um, you know, a lot of those traditionally came from Sweden and Finland and you can't even get those in at the moment, right, because of the COVID restrictions. So it does mean that, the, you know, we are a little limited in terms of how we can push the projects uh, forward. But you know, we do have some people lo locally that we can keep the things moving forward. But uh, I, am, I am itching to get in and, uh, you know, uh, walk the ground again myself. <laughs> so. Um you've um, faced or do you think there may 
you might face challenges from environmental groups in Norway and Sweden? Yeah, I think so. Most of the so I, I guess uh, so. So if I start with the case of Norway, so um, as I mentioned, because these are old mining districts, uh, you know, Norwegians are fairly pragmatic too. They realise that copper is a required. Uh, you know, there's there's very strong. Um, you know, I, I guess they've got, um, I guess, deadlines, you know, they want to be emissions free by 2050 and all of this sort of stuff. So Norwegians are fairly pragmatic and understand that copper is required. I, I probably wouldn't want to be out there trying to permit an open pit gold mine in Norway. I think that would be a, um, I think I, I personally wouldn't take that route, not saying it couldn't be done, but, uh, but, but that's not a route that I would particularly take. Um, but for something like this, where uh, you're producing a copper concentrate from an underground mine, for example, I, I think that's a fairly straightforward, um, you know, ask, and, and it's something that's already been done in the past. So um, now, and Sweden's also a bit of a, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, obviously everybody's got to be much more careful environmentally what they do. Uh, there have been a few projects that have been permitted. Um, you know, I think Bothnia Resources had a, a mine permit approved recently for a for a project. So, so permitting is happening. But again, in Sweden as well, you just need to be careful. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, you just need to make sure that you, you do the right thing, which is what we would do in any country uh, in any case. Um, but yes, we do, we do need to take more care. That's uh, There's certainly no doubt about that. Uh, but uh, I, I think they're both uh, still workable. But as I say, Norway, I think for a copper project like this, I don't see any, I don't see any big hurdles. Um, I wouldn't like to open a gold project in, in Norway, um, but Sweden, I think, already has a long mining history and, uh, you know, the yeah. gold mine. And, and in fact, just to the north of the gold line too, you've got the Boliden belt, which, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of operating mines there right now, right? So, so it's not like mining is, a, is an unknown here. Excellent. I um, want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, the replay will be available in about an hour after uh, we wrap up, which is going to be in uh, about 30 seconds. And um, on your way out, please share your feedback and we'll get it over to Eric and his team. Uh, Eric, I'll turn it back to you to, to close us and have the last word. Yeah, thanks, Sir Campbell. And uh, look, I, I think it's a great portfolio of projects we have, and we really do look forward to pushing these forward. As, and, and I think you'll see a lot of news flow as we go forward this year. And, uh, and uh, you know, we do look forward to taking these projects forward. So I think it's going to be, it'll be an exciting 2021 for Capella, for sure. So. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks everyone.